Hi there, um, I'm Ian Rogers, I'm an emergency medicine specialist and I'm here to talk to you about some of the medical risks of the Rottnest Channel Swim and specifically the risks that the solo swimmers might face. So you might ask why am I speaking about it? Well, I've run a series of research studies on the race, um, I've worked in the beachside medical tent, I've worked in the nursing post and perhaps most important of all, I've paddled across with a solo swimmer at least 10 times. So I think I've got some understanding of the sort of risks that you might face as a as a solo swimmer. So assuming you've managed to survive um, the errant propellers from boats, um, the biggest risk that you really need to worry about as a solo swimmer is what we call hypothermia. Hypothermia is a lowering of the body's core temperature and um, there are numbers that are associated with that but it's hard to measure people's core temperature out in the water so really we have to base our classification of hypothermia on what we see when we look at people and we divide hypothermia into mild and severe. A mild hypothermia many of you will have seen before. Someone who's mildly hypothermic will be a bit apathetic, they may lack coordination, their speech may be a little bit slurred. Some people say it's, it's like looking at someone who's drunk. Um, they may be shivering but of course that's hard to pick uh, when someone's in the water. In contrast severe hypothermia they become very markedly um, uncoordinated and they become increasingly confused and in fact their conscious state declines and eventually hypothermia will make you unconscious and of course the consequences of being unconscious when you're swimming out in the water um, are life-threatening. So that's how it presents. Um, I suppose the, the next question is, is how are we going to recognise it? And so the mild hypothermia, the sort of things that you're going to be looking for are people's stroke rate slowing down or their stroke style going off. I've noted as a paddler that when someone becomes hypothermic they tend to lose their sense of humour. Um, they can't actually laugh at, at what they're doing to themselves. They can't get that sort of wry smile, that, um, that, that realisation that what they're doing is actually a little bit crazy, um, uh, but they're hoping to survive. Whereas with severe hypothermia the really scary thing is that the swimmer will no longer recognise that they're hypothermic. They won't feel cold, um, they'll become very confused, disorientated, you may sw see them swimming uh, wildly off course, their stroke will really go off, their style will really go off. So what that means is that since they can't recognise it, it's very much up to the people on the boat um, and the paddlers to recognise those symptoms developing, um, symptoms and signs developing in the, in the hypothermic swimmer. So if you think someone's becoming hypothermic, what can you do about it? Well, with mild hypothermia, it might be just a question of keeping a close track on your swimmer, making sure that they keep their food intake and particularly their glucose intake up, but being prepared to take them out of the water if you think aren't going think things aren't going right. But if it's severe hypothermia, um, you've really got to get that person out of the water as quickly as possible. You want to do that gently and then you want to dry them and insulate them and then put them in some sort of windproof water a uh, windproof waterproof uh, barrier. Um, to protect them from any further heat loss. If you've got a space blanket that's great but another really simple way of doing it is to put them inside a really big gar bag. Just make a hole in the, um, the top of the bag um, to push their head through and then tighten up the, uh, the base of the gar bag around them. And then you're going to need to get them to medical attention. So you're going to need to notify uh, the race control um, and organise for some sort of medical assistance. So of course I've talked to you about how to recognise it and how to manage it, but we'd far prefer that no one becomes hypothermic in the race. But we know it's going to happen. Um, so what sort of risk factors have we identified that make it more likely? Well, it's really three things. The first thing is the temperature of the water. The second thing is how long you spend in that water. And the third thing is the amount of insulation that you've got to protect you from the cold in the water. Now the water temperature we can't control and that's going to vary from year to year and some years the incidence of hypothermia is quite low because the water temperature is quite high and in other years the incidence of hypothermia is quite high and sometimes we'll see it even in 25, 30, 40 percent of all solo swimmers will finish the race uh, with hypothermia. So the second thing is, is how long you spend in the water and what that means is if you're a slower swimmer that puts you particularly at risk and that's one of the reasons that we have those carefully thought out race cutoff times to protect people from the risk of hypothermia. And then the last one is insulation. One of my colleagues once said to be a, the best sort of rottenest swimmer or the safest sort of rot, rottenest swimmer you want to be built like a seal. You want plenty of muscle and plenty of fat. 
you want as much insulation as you can possibly put on. And that's difficult. I know sw some swimmers find that really difficult to put on that extra weight. But think about those three factors. Think about the temperature of the water, uh, the time that you're going to spend in the water, and the amount of insulation you're carrying with you. And if you think that you're at risk from any of those, be particularly cautious about the, the concerns for hypothermia. So knowing about those risk factors, I suppose we can think about some of the sort of preventative strategies that you can undertake. Um, try to put on that body weight before the race as well to give you that extra insulation, but you need to be particularly careful about your sugar intake, your carbohydrate intake during the race, because glucose is the energy substrate that your body uses to shiver, to generate heat. So that means you need some sort of regular input of sugar into your body throughout the race. And different swimmers do that in different ways. Some people eat jelly beans, some people use carbo shots, some people drink sports drinks, bananas, anything that you can get in that you find palatable that keeps that regular, what I call fueling the engine. Because you can't store enough glycogen, which is the way that your body stores glucose, to get yourself over to rot nest. You're going to have to keep refilling the tank. So you can do those sort of preventative things. And then I suppose last of all, is you've got to have a crew that you can trust. Um, I often say to people, if you're swimming solo, it's a really good idea for a member of your crew to be a nurse or a doctor or a paramedic, someone who actually has some understanding of hypothermia. But irrespective, you want to have paddlers and crew members that you can trust and you want to give them the absolute authority to take you out of the water if they think you're not right. Um, the skipper always has the, the last call on that. So one of the other problems that we've noticed in the swim of recent times is what we call pulmonary edema. Pulmonary edema is fluid building up on the lungs. And we think it's probably closely linked to hypothermia as well. Uh, what happens is that swimmers become hypothermic and as they become hypothermic and their stroke goes off, their style goes off, they start to swallow or breathe in some water and that salt water affects the lungs and produces this fluid accumulation on the lungs that can make produce a cough, can make people short, short of breath. If, if as a, a paddler or as a boat crew member you recognise that happening in, a, happening in a swimmer, you've got to ask yourself, is the swimmer really going to be well enough to continue to the other side of the island, uh, to the island, to the other side of the channel? And in particular, I suppose, if you've got concerns that they're hypothermic, that might be one of the other reasons that you really need to take the swimmer out and get them to medical attention as soon as possible. We think probably the best prevention for the pulmonary edema is simply to prevent significant hypothermia. And I've already talked about that before, about what we can do to prevent and recognise an early management of hypothermia. But if you have a swimmer who's getting a cough, complains of feeling short of breath, um, breathing really doesn't seem quite right in comparison to what you usually suspect, it's going to be wise to take them out of the water as well and get them to medical attention. Because we are seeing a few cases of this every year. And, and it actually is quite a significant problem as well. Think about all of those things. Um, try to prevent hypothermia. Um, know how to recognise it, how to manage it. Um, and let's, think, let's hope, fingers crossed, it doesn't happen to you.